Humanity lives in a world where interconnectivity is essential. Ever since the introduction of the smartphone, we've always found ways of communicating with each other. In 2004, Mark Zuckerberg released Facebook, the platform which changed the way humanity communicates socially forever. But did you know there has been a social network living under the ground for the last 400 million years that predates Facebook? This is the mycorrhizal fungi network. It exists beneath every forest and wood, every garden, every park, every road. This complex underground web of roots, fungi and bacteria help connect trees and plants to one another. Mycorrhizal networks are fascinating and complex. These systems allow plants to exchange nutrients, water, carbon, and even information with each other through fungal partners. These networks are found in almost every terrestrial ecosystem, and they can involve hundreds of plants and fungal species. But how do these networks work? And what are the benefits and costs of being part of them? Well, in this episode, we're going to uncover the network that lives beneath our feet. So sit back and relax, because this is going to be interesting. I'm your host, Mr. Earth Guy, and you're listening to Earth SciShow. The concept of an interconnected forest has evoked comparisons with the internet. Hence the moniker, the Wood Wide Web. The idea is that trees share resources and potentially communicate with each other through fungus seems fantastical and was a startling revelation upon its first discovery in the 1990s. And nearly three decades on, researchers have examined the evidence and found that while soil fungi are important, some of the popular claims made about the Wood Wide Web lack proof. Nearly all plants form partnerships with fungi living in their roots together known as mycorrhizas. Some of these fungi sprout mushrooms at the soil surface, but a mushroom is really just a tiny bit of what we see. Most mycorrhizal fungi live entirely underground, existing as only near invisible thread-like strands called hyphae that grow out of the roots of plants to explore the soil. By allowing these fungi to live in their roots, plants receive essential nutrients from the soil. The fungi, meanwhile, receive fruits of photosynthesis such as sugars and fats from their plant hosts. These fungal threads form vast webs in the soil known as common mycorrhizal networks which can connect plants together. Mycorrhizal fungi form the fiber optic cables in the wood wide web analogy. In 1997, scientists demonstrated that carbon, a primary energy source for all life, can be transmitted between trees across a mycorrhizal network. This finding prompted speculation that mycorrhizal fungi were helping trees communicate and share resources. Cooperation, rather than competition, was more significant in nature it seemed, a notion that challenged prevailing evolutionary dogma. But was this experiment fully true? Authors believe that despite the widespread belief that plants share food using mycorrhizal networks, the evidence remains inconclusive. In lab and field experiments, the amount of carbon and other resources transferred between plants is typically small and stays mostly in the mycorrhizal roots. This means that while fungi are receiving carbon from one plant, much of it probably stays in the fungus rather than being transferred to another plant. This raises the question of how important these transfers might actually be to trees in a forest. And is it the plants or the fungi who are in charge of transferring these sugars, fats and nutrients? What fungi are doing and why they do it is rarely considered in these studies. You see, there are different types of mycorrhizal networks that may have different effects on plant interactions. For example, Arbuscular mycorrhizal networks are formed by fungi that penetrate into plant cells and they create branch structures called arbuscules. These networks are common amongst grasses, herbs and crops and they can transfer nutrients such as phosphorus or nitrogen between plants. Ectomycorrhizal networks are formed by fungi that wrap around plants' roots without penetrating them. These networks are common amongst trees such as pines, oaks and birches and they can transfer carbon or water between plants. Researchers indicate that arbuscular mycorrhizal networks are more likely to facilitate resource sharing amongst plants than ectomycorrhizal networks. This is because they have more direct access to plant cells and less carbon demand from their fungal partners. And it's for these reasons why the researchers warn against humanizing the mycorrhizal networks by using terms such as the wood wide web or mother trees. While these terms may be useful metaphors for conveying complex scientific concepts to a wider audience, they also may misrepresent the nature of these interactions by implying human-like qualities such as intentionality or agency that are not supported by scientific evidence. 
But it's clear that mycorrhizal networks are indeed important for plant ecology and evolution, but they are not necessarily synonymous with plant communication or cooperation. Instead, it calls for more rigorous research on these topics using experimental approaches that can test causal mechanisms rather than relying on observational correlations. And one of these experiments is what we're going to discuss next. It's how plants use underground fungal networks to warn each other of aphid attacks. You may be thinking, what is an aphid attack? Well, aphids are small insects that suck sap from plant leaves and stems. They can cause significant damage to crops by reducing their growth and quality. They can also transmit viruses that can infect plants and cause diseases. Plants have various ways of defending themselves against aphids. One way is to produce chemicals called volatiles that attract natural enemies of aphids such as ladybugs or parasitic wasps. Another way is to produce chemicals called phytohormones. These trigger defense responses such as producing toxins or thickening cell walls. But what if a plant could warn its neighbors of an impending aphid attack before it happens? This could give them a head start in preparing their defenses and reducing damage. This is what researchers from China and Canada have recently discovered using a common crop called the broad bean. They found that when one broad bean plant was infested with aphids, it could send signals through a mycorrhizal network to another broad bean plant that wasn't infected yet. The receiving plant then increased its production of volatiles and phytohormones, making it less attractive and more resistant to aphids. The researchers also found that these signals were specific to broad bean plants and they were connected by an arbuscular mycorrhizal network. When they used other plant species, such as maize or tomatoes, as senders or receivers, they did not observe any signals or defense responses through the network. This research suggests that specificity may be due to differences in chemical compositions or compatibility between different plant species or fungal partners. They also suggest that these signals may be adaptive for broad bean plants because they often grow in dense patches where aphid infestation can rapidly spread. And this research is really exciting because their study provides novel evidence for how plants can use mycorrhizal networks to communicate biotic stress signals such as aphid attacks. The study also highlights the challenges and opportunities which other research can do in the future on this topic, such as identifying the chemical signals involved in the communication, understanding how these signals are regulated by environmental factors such as light or temperature, and exploring how these signals affect other organisms such as predators or pathogens, and then applying these findings to improve crop protection strategies. We've been through quite a lot today. We've learned about the wood wide web. I know I'm humanizing it, but it sounds cooler. And we've also seen how plants can communicate with each other to send stress signals across the network. And these stress signals aren't just for aphid attacks. There's evidence to suggest that plants can also send stress signals for forest fires, transferring valuable nutrients away from the affected zones so that plants may survive in other areas. But we'll leave that to another episode. You've been listening to Earth SciShow, and I'm your host, Mr. Earth Guy. And remember, stay curious. 